Over the years, the face of gaming has changed considerably, with the race to create new, innovative titles still as fast-paced as ever. While avid video game fans are always on the lookout for the latest thrill and the slicker specs, there are some titles out there that remain infallible examples of just how important it is to find a niche and exploit it until the very last, like EA's golden child, The Sims. So, how did a game with such a simple premise become a multi-billion dollar jewel in EA's crown? Let's rewind the decades to uncover the roots of The Sims, the hit game that was born from equal parts defiance and ingenuity, and that very nearly wasn't made at all. In order to get to the very start of this story, we need to hail all the way back to 1984. At this point, the gaming industry was still in its infancy. The obsession with arcade games like Pac-Man and Space Invaders was still at its peak, but one man was busy trying to design a game that would appeal to the action-thirsty, console-owning masses. 24-year-old Will Wright wanted to seize the opportunity that 1982's Commodore 64 presented by creating Raid on Bungling Bay. At the time, the helicopter game was well received, selling close to 30,000 units in America and nigh on a million units in Japan. For Wright's first ever release as a designer, it was the success he needed to solidify a reputation as one to watch. More importantly, Raid on Bungling Bay planted the seed for something much bigger. As Wright was designing the game on his level editor, he realized just how fun it was to create the islands from scratch. Little did the Georgia native know that this experience would be the catalyst for one of the biggest game franchises the world has ever seen. Raid on Bungling Bay not only raised Wright's rep, but it also raised his bank balance. With a little cash in his back pocket, he started to think about creating a game based purely on city building. Others had dabbled with this area before, but Wright had plans on his own. In no time at all, the idea for Sim City was born. Wright's vision for the project was clear, but the publishers that he shopped it to didn't understand the premise. This wasn't a game that had any tangible goal other than to build a successful community. Unlike other popular titles at the time, there was no visible bad guy and no points to score. Doors continued to close in Wright's face, until one opened that changed things forever. In a twist of fate, Wright met Jeff Braun at a pizza party in 1986. Braun had been looking for the right opportunity to invest in the video game market, and that's exactly what Wright presented. They soon discovered they had a lot in common. Braun also hoped to expand on his work in the gaming industry by eventually releasing his own project, Sky Chase. After seeing Wright's idea for SimCity, he believed that together, they had the basis to start their very own publishing company. The following year, they created Maxis. With the freedom and capital to bring his idea to life, Wright set to work. So the process of designing a game is very much like climbing up a tree. Every branch is a potential decision point, a different way the design can go. Based on our experience and guided by intuition, we're getting better and better at knowing which branches we should take. The two had great faith in the game's unique concept, but was that faith enough to carry it through? Luckily, Maxis wasn't the only company that saw potential in SimCity. Although Wright had initially offered the title to Broderbund when he was shopping it around, they, like everyone else, declined it. However, by 1988, when SimCity was almost finished, they had a change of heart. Executives were finally able to see how the game would have a mass market appeal. With hats in hand, Broderbund signed Maxis to a distribution deal. It was all systems go. But how would the critics react? Less than two years after Maxis was founded, SimCity hit the market. It was a huge risk for a newly born company to take. Unlike the other big, well-established publishers, Maxis didn't have an endless amount of capital to cushion the blow if the game was a flop. Maxis and Broderbund waited with bated breath. Sales were stagnant at first, leading Wright to wonder if the naysayers had been right all along. However, although it was slow to take off, SimCity became a huge sensation, surpassing all projections and allowing everyone involved to breathe a welcome sigh of relief. The risk had paid off. Players loved being able to step into a digital world that gave them complete power over an entire city and all who resided within it. While critics hailed it as the next big thing, SimCity's unique angle almost stopped it from being made at all. Publishers that had turned it down believed the concept was just too close to everyday life, and therefore far too mundane to be a serious hit. But that key ingredient served to be the very thing that propelled it to greatness. By 1992, over a million copies had been sold, 
all doubts had firmly died out. Maxis reigned supreme as the little engine that could, proving that corporate America isn't always right. However, the company's fight with the man had only just begun. Maxis had established itself as a worthy young business in a short space of time. Together, Wright and Braun had proved the bigwigs of the gaming industry wrong. Like any commercial business looking to continue a winning streak, the dynamic duo was keen to capitalize on the success of SimCity straight away. Over the next few years, they released an onslaught of different Sim-related titles, hoping to expand the original game into different versions. Sim Earth allowed players to level up from building cities to run the development of an entire planet, while Sim Ant was a quirky twist on the original game that required the player to successfully manage an ant colony. While both were interesting prospects, neither was as successful as Sim City. During the first half of the early 90s, Wright and Braun continued to toil away at developing their catalog of simulation games, but fans were keen for one title in particular. While players were still avidly enjoying the first SimCity game, there was a growing appetite for more. Spurred on by the commercial failure of titles like The Crystal Skull and rapidly depleting capital, Maxis put the pedal to the metal and amped up efforts to release a sequel to SimCity. SimCity 2000 for Apple Mac was finally released in 1993, and fans were more than ready for it. The game retained many of the original features that players loved, but gone was the top-down perspective. The upgrade to isometric graphics gave players a much more immersive experience. Not only that, but the gameplay itself was even more realistic, with multiple added elements, like the ability to create underground layers and sewer systems. Essentially, it was Sim City on steroids. Both critics and players alike were won over by the impressive new features, which saw sales and ratings also rise. Maxis was the king of the castle once more. But despite SimCity 2000's continuously high sales throughout the 90s, the company was taking on water, and fast. They needed to find a buyer. That's where EA came in. The initial deal saw EA acquire Maxis for $125 million in stocks, EA got the golden key to the SimCity titles, while Maxis would get the financial backing from a much bigger company. It seemed like a match made in heaven, but it came with one major drawback. Wright, Braun, and the team at Maxis no longer had the final say over what titles they could produce. As a division of EA, Maxis had to seek approval for all new projects. And thus, a power struggle was born that almost blocked the creation of one of the world's most successful games. While Maxis had been toiling away at producing different sim titles for years, Will Wright had been toying with the idea of a different kind of simulation game. Even prior to the release of SimCity 2000, Wright had liked the idea of creating a title that was more people-centric than simply building structures and sewer systems. However, at the time, Maxis was bound by limited finances, and developing such a game was too much of a risk. His dedication to the concept only increased after he lost his home in the Oakland firestorm of 1991. Faced with the devastating task of rebuilding, Wright realized that there was something alluring about the ins and outs of home renovation, and for a brief time, touted a game idea called Home Tactics. In theory, the player could enjoy all aspects of the building process from the ground up, including design, carpentry, and home decor. It wasn't long until he realized that such a game could be both people-centric and design-oriented, with the success of gameplay largely measured on how happy the characters were with their curated lives. The Sims was born. To modern audiences, this is a concept that's well known, but back then it seemed even more impossible to make than Sim City. In order to get Sim City off the ground, Wright had to establish his own company. With those days firmly behind him, he now had to take his idea to the board of Maxis and EA. Over 40% of the employees that Maxis had were made redundant during the merger process, which didn't work in Wright's favor. While Wright and Braun both had seats on the board themselves, their vote alone wouldn't be enough to see the concept go into full development. Wright was well respected as the inventor of SimCity, but he was also known to bet on the losing horse on occasion. After all, Maxis had more failures than successes under its belt. The board sat and they listened to Wright's proposal of a living dollhouse game. With bewildered amusement, they struggled to see the mass appeal of instructing characters to take out the trash or pay the bills. Needless to say, enthusiasm for the project was almost non-existent. Jeff Braun later recalled, the board looked at The Sims and said, what is this? 
he wants to do an interactive dollhouse, this guy is out of his mind. Wright was up against a company that didn't believe in The Sims at all. To them, gaming was about the thrill of the chase, the fantasies that could be acted out on screen. How and why would players want to play a game that essentially copied the monotony of everyday life? How was that escapism? Despite the intense opposition, Wright continued to fight for the game, and eventually, his persistence paid off. Perhaps just to keep him quiet, EA agreed to put the game into development, but with sales projections of just 160,000 units, it was clear from the beginning they weren't expecting big things. In fact, deep down, bosses didn't really think that sales would even reach this meager sum. Essentially, EA was so certain that the game would flop that they were setting Wright up to fail. Little did they know, they were actually setting the stage for a David vs Goliath situation that no one could have predicted. Wright took what limited funding he could get and set about his passion project with a small team of developers determined to bring his dream to fruition. The little engine that could was running again, and it was about to surpass all expectations. In the year preceding the release of The Sims, the market was heavily geared towards games with a different vibe, with titles like Command & Conquer 2, Age of Empires 2, and Half-Life all proving popular. The premise was simple. Gamers wanted action, violence, and a sense of accomplishment in the face of adversity. However, two god games topped the bestseller list, with Wright's very own SimCity 3000 coming in second to Chris Sawyer's Roller Coaster Tycoon. Even though EA knew just how popular this niche could be, The Sims seemed to be too much of a leap of faith for them. Wright and his team were no strangers to simulation games. In fact, thanks to SimCity, Wright was already a renowned designer in that area. When The Sims hit shelves in February 2000, Wright was no longer just a god game designer. He had achieved godlike status himself. Why do you think The Sims did so well? I think two reasons, really. I think, first of all, The Sims was accessible. It wasn't about fantasy, it wasn't about sports or military history, it was about everyday life, something that everybody could relate to and can understand the basic rules. And the second one is that Sims kind of allowed people to be very expressive and creative. They could tell their own stories, create their own characters, replay their own life in the game. So, why did fans love this game so much when EA was convinced it was a dud? Players were given the gift of something that no one had ever really seen before. Avatars have always been a fun part of play in numerous titles, giving gamers the ability to dress up and personalize their characters to make them feel more connected to the virtual world. The Sims took this idea and ran with it. But more importantly, these avatars weren't just nice side notes to a points-based concept. They were the concept in its entirety. EA may have been worried that consumers would hate the idea of recreating everyday life, but it proved to be the element that fans wanted the most. With 20,000 simoleons to start, players could choose to buy an empty lot and create their very own home from the ground up, or buy a little starter home and eventually move up the property ladder. All the while, they would have to keep up with their Sims' needs, or completely ignore them to the point of catastrophe. Perhaps most importantly, The Sims provided an element of freedom that other games did not. There was no set route to follow, no boss to beat, and no level to fail. The idea was simple, do what you want and have fun with it. And when the sales figures eventually came in, the executives were left dumbfounded. As time wore on, the notoriety of the game continued to grow. By the end of the year 2000, just 10 months after The Sims was released, it had sold almost 2 million copies in the US alone. While the cost of developing the game was never made public, it garnered revenue of over $70 million in that time alone. It's safe to say that it proved to be a wise investment for EA, even if the board didn't want to invest a cent in it in the first place. As for Wright, he was re-established as the Golden Boy, having proved that Maxis wasn't a one-trick pony, but instead a force to be reckoned with. With renewed interest in The Sims, EA was keen to satiate the growing appetite of players and order the development of a sequel straight away. In the meantime, Wright and his merry band of men got to work on an element that would become one of the most successful parts of the entire franchise. The very first expansion pack hit the shelves in August 2000. Live in Large injected a new lease of life into the game, keeping Sims fans hooked as they explored different careers, new objects, and tried to fend off new NPCs, like the now infamous Grim Reaper and Servo. 
These elements in particular added more excitement to the gameplay, as players had no control over when and where these characters would appear. Sims now also had the ability to move to different neighbourhoods, widening the perimeters of the game even further. The arrival of expansion packs was a genius move from EA for a variety of reasons. It kept the game current, while work continued on The Sims 2, and it meant that The Sims had endless revenue potential. By the time the sequel was released in 2004, players had been presented with seven expansion packs, which included the arrival of pets, vacations, and even elements like Magic Town. These new elements offered up a completely different side to gameplay, proving that even though The Sims was a live simulation game, nothing was out of bounds. Sims could moonlight as wizards, or even plant beanstalks. The more players got, the more they wanted, and with each pack costing around $30, it was a goldmine. Fans couldn't get enough. There were always more objects, more worlds, and more possibilities. But there was another key element to gameplay that was fast taking hold. Prior to the release of The Sims, cheats in games were largely designed to help players get to the end goal easier. That could have meant defeating the boss, skipping a level entirely, or finding hidden objects that were necessary to move forward toward completion. Cheats in The Sims had an altogether different premise. For instance, the Rosebud cheat became popular with players because it allowed them to get rich at the touch of a button without having to toil away at earning a mediocre salary. More money meant more freedom to build extravagant homes without worrying about paying the bills or going to work. Other shortcuts could make grass grow, insert pre-built homes into a lot, or allow you to see Sims' personality traits that were previously hidden. Along with expansion packs, cheats would become a key factor in gameplay for many fans as the franchise continued to grow. Cheats weren't frowned upon or discouraged, but were simply tools that allowed players to create a much more personalized, finely tuned experience. Wright and EA set a precedent for the evolution of The Sims early on, and the momentum kept on going in the years that followed. Not only did developers continue to push the boundaries and explore the sandbox, but they also experimented with releasing on different platforms. The Sims busting out hit the market in 2003, giving console players their first foray into the series, while The Sims 2, for PC, was finally released in 2004. Each title was welcomed with open arms, introducing new elements to Wright's ever-growing world. The Sims 2 was dubbed by critics as a reawakening. EA did what many game developers often fail to do, and listened to the wants and needs of players. They delivered a more complex interaction between Sims, heightened emotions, and the arrival of aspirations. As well as wants and needs, Sims now had life goals that tied into their satisfaction level. Up until this point, the game itself was largely goalless and hobby-centric, but now players could choose to utilize this feature by adding a different element to gameplay, allowing them to work towards something in a way that still gave them total freedom. Once again, it was a hit. The entire Sims franchise that EA had once written off as a complete waste of time became the company's flagship title over the next decade. EA was thrilled, but Wright needed a new challenge. David left Goliath in 2009, ready and hungry for a new barrier to break. While Wright was instrumental as the creator of The Sims, he wasn't a one-man machine. The development of the franchise continued to roll along without Wright's input, but there's just one thing that can't be denied. In the 10 years after the first game was released, Wright didn't simply establish one of the most lucrative video game franchises in the world. He established a cultural phenomenon. The Maxis founder's original living dollhouse idea became much bigger than even he could have imagined. Perhaps one of the most interesting elements about the evolution process is that The Sims managed to make gamers out of people otherwise uninterested in gaming. And there's all the toilets. Well, that's not a toilet. Open air, natural toilet. It's a bush. <laughs> <laughs> Adults and children alike have remained infatuated with living vicariously through Sims for over two decades. The magic of the appeal isn't lost. And this is her daughter, Carly. She wants to find a soulmate, she's mean, and she likes stealing stuff from time to time. This has only been spurred on thanks to celebrity endorsements from the likes of Katy Perry in 2012. We have a sticky in a park, skip a dibba in a yard, in a hot shower tark. Famed TV host Drew Carey even appeared in the original House Party expansion pack, showing up in a limo when characters threw a successful party. The Sims may have started out as a simulation game, but it became larger than life. Over the past few years, EA has continued to try and push The Sims into different places, expanding on apps, internet-based games, 
and even introducing a reality TV show called The Sims Sparked in 2020, where contestants went head-to-head -head with their creations in a bid to win $100,000. EA continues to profit from the game it once shunned, with over 200 million units sold, multiple different titles over numerous different platforms, and lifetime sales that exceed $5 billion. However, the same can't be said for Maxis. The company Wright & Braun founded was shut down by EA in 2015. Maxis has officially shut down. Let me make this clear though, and some people seem to be confused, this has nothing to do with The Sims team. That's another Maxis studio, The Sims studio and whatnot, making The Sims 4 and everything. The Sims isn't affected, but old school Maxis is gone. With Maxis succumbing to the will of its buyers once and for all. During its tenure as part of EA, Maxis proved that it was capable of greatness in the face of adversity, creating some of EA's biggest and most profitable titles. But ultimately, that wasn't enough to keep it working as an independent studio. The decision came a year after the fourth and latest Sims game was released, leaving fans wondering what happens next. It's been over six years since The Sims 4 was released, yet EA continued to release new add-ons and expansion packs on a regular basis. As of early 2021, picking up all the expansion packs and add-ons costs in excess of over $700. Once upon a time, expansion packs acted to tide over fans whilst the team worked on the sequel, but now they act as the primary focus of the franchise, to draw out a title as long as possible, and monetize each and every aspect of it. It's very clear that EA is keen to generate as much income as possible, while fans continue to wait for news of any potential future titles, but there's one lingering question that does need to be addressed. With Maxis no longer at the wheel and EA focused heavily on expanding the profitability of The Sims, who is focused on the future of The Sims itself? Will EA continue to innovate and expand the game in a way that pays homage to long-standing players? Or without David to keep Goliath in check, is The Sims doomed to become just another forgotten trend? Or worse yet, will it become one more money-making tool designed to satiate corporate greed at the expense of fans? The legacy of Wright's creation has proved that it's strong enough to withstand almost anything. But perhaps for the first time, the future of this undisputed classic remains unclear. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Sims Origins. We'll be back next time for another fascinating look into the world of gaming. Until then, I've been Emil Cole, and I'll see you next time.